morning, Liberty. We're going to do our first tip. because she thought it was another song. I Yeah, this was a mistake. I thought it was a different one. So you all get to learn a new song today. It's, it's pretty. It's it's pretty, but it's different. I thought it was, I love to tell the story. Good luck. Not the same. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm really proud of you, Dick, for showing up today. Good job.
That makes one of us happy. <laughs> Thank you Good for job. your singing. We're going to have to start with a vote on that tune, and uh, all in favor stand up. <laughs> Aaron likes it. Aaron likes it. Aaron stand up. He sung really loud. I did hear him too. Um, I'd like to start off the morning with, your, with the announcements. Uh, if you look at the back of your bulletin, oh, by the way, we're glad you're here this morning. I have, the, I have details on the mission of the month when you. Okay. The love gift mission of the month. We'll start with that. Uh, so every year we traditionally do a, a coin drive for the love gift. Uh, the, this is a national offering for uh, American Baptist Women's and Girls Ministries. But this year that will start uh, being just like received for Indiana, uh, ABW and ABGs. Um, so... Long story short, I ordered the wrong size boxes, so now we have a competition. So for the month of February, you get to give to Love Gift by voting for your favorite team up here. <coughs> so clearly the one that gets the most is the favorite, but your team won't get the money, Love Gift will. So if you want a little box to bring home so that you can st uh, store it up and then come and dump it in on Sundays, there you go, but um, for the month, we will be challenging each other. And I, I'm sure Dick will carry the load for <laughs> Purdue. Well, he might not have any money left. Uh -huh. So. Oh, 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 it'll make up for it. Got it. So, anyway, that we're, uh, we're flipping it a little bit. So, show your love by donating to Love Gift for your favorite team. Okay. Uh, today is a calendar planning meeting after church. And everybody's going, right? Uh, yeah. If you've got something you want on the calendar, <laughs> I suggest you show up. Uh, February 22nd is Ash Wednesday, Wednesday service. Uh, the 26th is a baptism class at 945, the first one. The 12th of March is the second one. And, and those are the same class, just two different date and time offerings. So, so you don't have to go to both. You just need to go to one to discuss baptism. We'll even heat the water up this year. Uh, <laughs> April 9th is actually Easter Sunday and it will be the baptism. So, And then of course we have our ongoing announcements, Bible study, donuts with Gary, Sunday school, pastoral care with Mariah, online giving. Uh, are there any other announcements from the floor? Jay, I'm really disappointed you didn't do your spiel. <laughs> Brenda tried last week, but we're going to be starting handbell practice in a couple of weeks. So if you would like to continue playing, or maybe you didn't play before, but you would like to, just please let me know so I can be sure you have a part. I just wanted to draw your attention to notice that we have several queens in our congregation today. Okay, if there's no other announcements, we're going to have what's called happy dollars. <laughs> and uh, you can only talk if you're happy. <laughs> That leaves out one person. Are you are you going to, to censor grumpy dollars? I, I think we may have to. Are you? We may have to cut this down a little bit. But we will take your money. I'm just saying. Do we do we have somebody ready to be? Yeah. Oh, good. I love this one. This is a good one. I'm happy for my grandma's birthday today. Oh, yay! Yay! Happy birthday. Because both of my parents are going to Mexico to go drink alcohol. <laughs> I'm happy because while mommy and daddy are gone, I'm going to spend, um, spend three days with my grandma and we're going to the movie. 
Excellent. I have a dollar for uh, my last week. I spent the week, had a good visit with Janet in Florida. And the other dollar is for uh, a good basketball game I saw on TV last night. <laughs> I'm going to have to owe or Venmo or something, but um, we have a lot to be happy about. We had Abby, um, Abby's team won the sectional last night. Woohoo! Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Abby. Did you want to do that? You can do it. You can do it again. <laughs> I can. Um, and of course, the IU game, which I have to admit I, I didn't watch because I was so nervous about the sectional and I was nervous, but we also, the kids and I found a house to rent, so we are going to be moving, and so we're very excited about all that stuff. You need to go to Mexico? <laughs> yes! I just thank God Matt Payton wasn't in our living room yesterday. <laughs> You know, I'm happy that IU won because they've only lost nine in a row and went through three coaches trying to beat Purdue. I'm happy after two weeks gone, I'm back. So. I'm just happy. I'm happy we had a great trip to South Africa. Um, it is a little bit colder here than it is there, so I don't know about the happy to be back part. But, and also, Eric and I wanted to announce we are going to have a baby. Yeah! It's, a, it's about time. Jesus. So, Jay, are we gonna start calling you Grandpa now? I don't care, I'm old enough. <laughs> The deacons thank you for your happy dollars that are used in the community as we see fit to help those in need. Uh, this time we'll have our call to worship. Let's join together in prayer. God, we thank you for the gift of today, for joyful celebrations and a chance to honor you. Lord, we pray that we feel your presence in this space, both through our laughter and our worship, but also through the ways we study scripture and crave your heart. As we seek after you, meet us there and transform us in that space. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our candle lighters up, maybe. Are we not ready? Do you need one of these? She's getting it? Okay. Take a moment to just reflect on things you're joyful about in your hearts as we prepare for our candlelighters. children at heart up front for a message from Nam. Come on down. Have a good night. How tall are you now? I don't know. 
I just keep getting thicker. I know it. I about have to look in your and shout your belly button so you can hear me through your ears. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Do you yell at the television when I use play? No. Well, Dick yells at those players, and it just scares me a nervous wreck. I just can't. So I told him yesterday, so if I go in the living room, he yells at Painter and he yells at. And I told him, I says, unless you play the game, you keep quiet. But he doesn't, he doesn't listen to me. And Tom sent Pam a picture, and he says, don't worry, I'm just, just, uh, he said, I'm only going to have one drink. And that thing was, that thing around, I could have gone swimming in it. But I don't think he drank all of it. And those old men got out on the floor. You know, when they stormed the floor, my son-in-law stormed, and he's gone into college. But anyway, you know, there was this real rich woman, and she wanted a bird that would talk. So she went to the pet store, and she told him, told him what she wanted, and he got this, all the most beautiful parrots you've ever seen. And he says, this is guaranteed to talk. So she took it home, and he said, just talk to it a lot. Um, if I had a parrot, and I said to talk to it a lot. Mine would never shut its mouth because I talk all the time. But anyway, um, so she took it back and she says, this parrot will not talk. And he says, well, let me give you a mirror. And you take it home and says, usually, you know, he'll think there's another one in there and he'll start talking to it. So the next week she brought it back and she says, I am furious. This bird will not talk. So he said, well, maybe he needs exercise. He says, take this ladder, and if the bird does not talk next week, I will give you your money back or give you a new bird. So she come in the next week, and she says, the bird died. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry. He says, did it ever talk? And she said, yes. It said, don't they sell food, bird food at that store? And you know, we can have we can come to church every Sunday and we can have a lot of Bibles, but until we dig into God's Word and feed on His Word, it's not going to do us any good. So remember, we've got to read the Bible, and it says that Jesus is the bread of life, and that is right. So we got to believe in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us your Word that gives us strength and courage to live each day. Thank you, dear God, for these children. And thank you for the parents that love them enough to bring them to church to get to know you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
sunshine. We give back to your blessings you've bestowed upon us. Help us to use this as you see fit and further your works here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll have a prayer request and concerns. Is that if you look at the back of your bulletin, is there anyone we need to add or subtract from the list? few here. Baby Rose Freud, she is doing better. She's home. The liver is, is rejuvenating and she's just doing great. You can't tell anything is wrong with her. So thanks for all the prayers for her. Um, Marsha Bagwell is a lady who uh, leads Bible study for myself and a few of our providers at the Southway Medical Practice and she had surgery. She's doing well but needs prayers for the pain control. And she has a eight-year-old nephew by the name of Matthew, who I've had on the prayer list before, who's in need of a kidney transplant, but unfortunately, the father, uh, who's an ex, um, for whatever reason, he is not signing consent for the boy to have that until all the legal things about the divorce are the way he wants them. So we ask for prayers for change of heart for him. Right now, this little boy is getting dialysis, and and they're having to put in another shunt because the one they had is not working right. And then my brother and sister-in-law, Bob and Pam. And my stepbrother, Todd, and Laura, they have a little baby, Graham. He's three months old, and he has been throwing up for the last week. And he's been in and out of the hospital, but they finally discovered he has a hernia and he has um, an ulcer. <clears throat> so, yeah. But they have been able, the last couple of days, to treat it with medicine and he's been able to keep some food down. So I just pray for him because it's scary when your baby three months old, you know, is so sick. So. And, and, um, yes, yeah, so I talked to Peggy Webster's um, daughter this week, and she said that the leukemia is in the bone marrow. And uh, Peggy, she said she'd keep us um, posted, but keep her in your prayers. I got trouble with Grandpa. <laughs> he's he's doing okay. I mean, he's in a lot of pain, but. Um, I snuck off to church because he was sleeping, so, <laughs> um, but he's doing okay. He, he's getting better. He's, well, I know who it is. Dustin. Yeah, Dustin. <laughs> yeah, Dustin. Oh, my gosh. I asked him, though, right after the surgery, he was, like, the day later, he was getting a lot of pain. I walked in, I go, hey, you want to go to the trampoline park? <laughs> and he said, shut up. <laughs> so, I don't think I'll have a problem with that. <laughs> Um, okay, these are um, people who we knew who have passed away, so prayers for their family. Alice Weedrick, um, she was, was the, a pastor's wife, who Bo and I were very active in that church, at the Methodist Church, and just a sweet, joyful lady, and she's probably in her 90s, so they had three or four children, so grandchildren, great grandchildren, and Rose this gal is here, Rose Addington family, if that's her best name. Um, and I pray that we believers be good witnesses when out and when are in our homes even. Um, I, I can't give details on this, but will you just pray for Josh's family? That's all I can say for you, but... God knows what it is, and just keep his family in prayers. Okay, at this time, if you bow your heads. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you today to ask for these healing touch as you see fit. Help us to guide us in our relationships. Help us find healing. Help, help touch those who need touched. 
help them to find the courage to come forward, help them to be healed. All over the world at this time, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This time we'll have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Here, Denny, um, her son Nick Bailey, their son Nick Bailey, um, is on the prayer list, and he's been having ongoing problems. And most recently, saw an eye doctor um, about his vision problems. Um, he had a procedure not that long ago that tried to help with things, and it took care of some of the stuff, but not all of the stuff. Um, so he's still dealing with struggles, um, and they're trying to hold off on. Uh, surgery just because the doctor's not convinced it will solve the problem right now so did I do you feel like I covered that okay okay <laughs> right right um, our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 5 this is verses 13 through 20 you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people put a light, people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. <laughs> Don't even think, begin to think, that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. name of your generation, like what your generation's title is? Do you know where your title comes from? Out of the different generational names, where, do, where does it come from? No, generational names, like uh, the baby boomers, the, the silent generation, generation X. 
So here's, here's currently like our, our span. We've got the greatest generation, they would be in their 90s right now, then the silent generation, baby boom or boomers, generation X, millennials, generation Z, which some are calling the Zoomers, um, and generation alpha, which would be any of the tiny tots in here, if they were born after 2010, they are alpha. So where do we know where any of these titles come from? The greatest generation. I'm pretty sure Tom Brokaw gave that yeah. to World War II um, veterans. Yeah. Or anyone, I guess, like I was born during that war. Right. And he was born, yeah, during the war. Both of us. So that's the greatest. Yeah, the greatest generation, um, they were born 1901 to 1927. So, um, I know that they would have seen both world wars. Um, um, yeah, so silent generation is 1928 to 1945. Um, and that one was one where when I was looking into it to try to figure it out, there were different theories about why they got that name. One of them was like, this is the generation that just puts their head down and soldiers on. Like, they just keep going. Um, they don't challenge the status quo, they just do what they, you know, do the thing and move on. And I saw others that said that it was because the phrase about kids um, being seen and not heard was very popular at that time and things changed after that generation. That one wasn't very clear. Baby boomers, come on guys, we, yes. we know why boomers. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the baby boomers and all of these people coming home from war and then, woo, lots of babies. I wonder how that happened. Generation X was another interesting one uh, because um, it was like one of them, the irony, is like Generation X is undefinable. And so, but that is a definition. You get it. You, one person laughed. Like, we're undefinable. That's our definition. Okay. Um, I can tease them because that is, that is the generation just above me. So that's 1965 to 1980. And then us millennials. Why are they millennials? Yeah, our formative years were right at the turn of the millennium, so 1981 to about 1996. Um, that means millennials, a lot of us are approaching our 40s now, if you notice that. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> I have to, Josh, is, Josh, it's only like two months, and, and he's there, and so he's like, it's fine. Um, so we've got our millennials, um, and then Generation Z, would be the ones right after us. Um, so 1997 to 2010. Um, so those are the ones that like are now coming of age right now. And then we've got our tiny ones. I'll, I'm interested to see what um, Generation Alpha's label is gonna be. Like it's frequently some event that happens or some there's some defining characteristic that gets you your label, you know? And I'm really curious about what uh, Generation Alphas will be. Um, would you change your label if you, if for your generation if you could? It's, I mean, mine seems to fit. Um, I do think there's, there's, there's some people who will add um, elder millennial or um, zennials for those that are like closer to Gen X or you know, some want to call it the Star Wars generation, like <laughs> where we were formed by that stuff. I would accept it, but um, but I think about labels and how frequently those labels um, shape us. <laughs> you know, you would think it would be the other way around, but sometimes the labels we claim 
we, we kind of become self-fulfilling prophecies and we embody them. Um, whether we want to accept um, the full gravity of it or not, sometimes we claim a label or a title. Um, and in our text for today, we'll see this dialogue between God and his people. And it's going to sound a little bit like Micah 6, um, that they're having this dialogue and they seem to want to be claiming their label, but not taking the full gravity of it. And so there's this interaction about like, okay, you've got the title, but you're not doing the responsibility part. Uh, so we're going to investigate that label today in Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 and investigate their labels and then also consider our own. So you're welcome to read along in your Bible or um, on the text behind me as I play Rearrange the Glasses. Um, and we go from there. This is Isaiah 58. Shout loudly, don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their crime, to the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day, desiring knowledge of my ways, like a nation that acted righteously that didn't abandon their God. They ask me for righteous judgments, wanting to be close to God. Why do we fast and you don't see? Why afflict ourselves and you don't notice? Yet on your fast day, you do whatever you want and oppress all your workers. You quarrel and brawl, and then you fast. You hit each other violently with your fists. You shouldn't fast as you are doing today if you want to make your voice heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I chose? A day of self-affliction? Of bending one's head like a reed and of lying down in mourning clothes and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast I chose? Releasing wicked restraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated and breaking every yoke. Isn't sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them and not hiding from your family? Then your light will break out like dawn, the dawn and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and God will say, I'm here. I do like hearing the, the overlap of this Isaiah passage with Micah 6, 8, that we, Micah 6 that we talked about last week. Um, so we know already, because we've talked about this for a couple weeks, that Isaiah covers a large span of time. Um, we have pre-exile, exile, post-exile, post like returned to the Holy Land. Um, and that likely Isaiah had some disciples that helped record the stories um, or the prophecies because of how much time had spanned, it is longer than Isaiah is recorded to have lived. So um, he likely had some trained some people to help record these things. So um, we are in the section where it would have been um, the final time era. So post exile, they've returned to the Holy Land. Hosea would be during this time as well. And um, they're all, they're getting settled in to, back into their normal routine, but it doesn't seem like exile has changed them at all. They don't really seem to have um, absorbed the lesson they received um, from going into exile for the consequences of their actions. Um, a few weeks ago, we looked at uh, Isaiah 49, and in that we hear, heard language of a singular servant named Israel that would come to redeem the people and be a light to the nations. 
um, and how Christians typically translate that as meaning Jesus. Jesus is this promised redeemer that's coming. Um, and our Jewish siblings translate that slightly different way. But um, now we're in a section where the, God is once again using the term servant, um, but in the plural. And so we see like a, a message of like, if you identify as my people, you are identifying as a servant of mine. Um, that is an indicator or a title, but also the responsibility we hold. So if you are my people, you are also a servant. And this is what servants look, my servants look like. Um, and so we see throughout this section an unfolding of the comparison of people who are God's people, who are righteous and following after God's instructions, and then the wicked people who reject God's structure and instructions. And this contrast in how God's calling his people, what he wants to see from them. And at the core of it, you, you're able to identify that really, sometimes their behaviors are the same, but the motivation is what changes. Because there are people who are fasting, and fasting is a beautiful spiritual practice, but they're fasting so that they can like get something from God. If I insert a fast, what, what will come out of the God vending machine? You know, will I get a chocolate bar? Will I get my prayer answered? Right, for the wrong reasons. Their motivation is selfish. Um, I'll, I'll follow God's rules, but only if it benefits me. Not because I'm compelled to the lifestyle that God has structured. Whereas God's servants, they know God's character and see that God's intentions and design for creation lead to flourishing. And so they are compelled to follow it because of who God is. Not to earn something, but because they, they are awed by who God is and they want to. It's like being drawn into it. Like I can't hold back because, oh. God is so good. This is such a great design. It's going to lead to flourishing and connection and love and trust. Yeah, I want to go that way. Yes. Being stirred by the Holy Spirit as opposed to be treating God like a vending machine. And I, I um, appreciate this comparison. And I want us to, to take a second to, to think about these bigger pictures of what God's looking for. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I can get stuck in a spiritual rut. Sometimes um, I catch myself being that person who does the thing and goes, okay, if I pray, I'm told if I pray, then I'll get the thing. So here I am. La, 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 la. Let's, let's work on breaking ourselves out of that for a minute. So, um, if anybody can remember um, in Micah 6, the, the topic was sacrifice. And they were talking about um, what, am God, am I supposed to like completely burn up this um, calf? Do you want like a thousand rams? How about my firstborn son? You know, like, and God was like, no, that's not what I want for a sacrifice. This is what I want. What were the three things mentioned in Micah 6, 8? Love, justice. Um, some translations may just say do justice. What was the second one? Love, faithfulness. Some translations will say mercy. Uh, or show mercy. Yep. Yeah. And what was the last one? Walk humbly. Okay. So they were so disconnected from God that they couldn't figure out what God wanted. They were like, nope, I don't get it. Like, I mean, not even sacrificing my firstborn son will make you happy, God. I don't know what to do. And God's like, no, it's not complicated. Justice, mercy, humility. Come on, guys. That is the sacrifice I'm looking for. Um, and then here, in Isaiah 58, um, we see 
another flipping. So instead of a fast, instead of them just going through the motions, there's a series of things that God suggests instead of fasting in verses 6 and 7. Um, can you, do you notice any in 6 and 7? I'll just wait. That's fine. How about releasing the wicked restraints? So, um, one of them was releasing restraints. And there were a few other versions in that same thing. Breaking yoke. There was another one in that same verse, kind of along the same line. Um, we see setting free the mistreated. So we see kind of a repeat happen in verse 6. Releasing restraints, untying yoke, setting free the mistreated, breaking yokes. So we get this general vibe of liberation here. I don't want fasting, I want liberation. Okay? And then verse 7, we have another series of themes. What are some actions you hear in, in verse 7? Feeding the hungry. Shelter the poor. Sheltering the poor. And there's another one. Clothe the naked. Yeah. Uh, and not hiding from your own family. About what that? Oh, not to ignore your own flesh and blood. Um, I, there are so many thoughts I have, you know, about the the, the unpacking of that. Um, so so then there's there's a connection to family, but the bottom line we see out of this um, list is an attitude of hospitality. Right? Um, a hospitable heart. <clears throat> My pen is dying. So we have, I don't want your sacrifices. I want justice, mercy, and humility. I don't want fasting. I want liberation and hospitality. And it, God is not saying that those practices are bad. What he's saying is why you're doing them is the thing that's a mistake. Your motivation behind them, if you're just doing it to try to get me to do something, stop. If you're just showing up to church because you hope God will listen to your prayers because you did one religious thing for the week, stop. I know it's not really beneficial for growing churches for a pastor to say stop going to church. <laughs> but, yes, Bo. Today in Sunday school, we were reading about Esther and fasting was a very important part yes. of the decision to go before the king. Yes. And yeah. She tested that Mordecai and all the Jews that he could gather did fasting also. So there was a definite motive there that he was suffering. No, they definitely were seeking after God. So what Bo was saying is in Sunday school, they talked about Esther. That's why we have some beautiful crowns here, because they're talking about a queen, Esther. Um, and that fasting was a large portion of her preparing to go before the king. And so not just her, but her uncle, cousin, relative, Mordecai, and um, some of the other Jews in the area were fasting in preparation. Like, it was an act of prayer. Not like, okay, God, you know, can you just can you just get me a Bentley? Like, if I fast for a little while, can I have a Bentley? Or uh, maybe a trip to Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> if 
you've ever wondered what I was like as a child, there is, there is a little girl in their family that is a very good example of what I was like. Kindred spirit. But the heart condition is what God's looking for if you are identifying yourself as God's people. We can claim to be Christians all we want, but if we are not transformed by God's truth, there's no point in clinging to that label. If we want to call ourselves Christians, we are to be faithfully pursuing God's truth and letting it change us. Shedding away selfish motivations to move towards what God designed. Last week we talked about the upside down kingdom, and this week I, I see this as a revelation of a heart transformation. We can do all the religious things. We can show up to church every week, we can come to Bible study, we can memorize scripture, but if it's not impacting our heart and our mind, it's just a ritual. It's just a fast or a sacrifice we're doing to try to get something from God. Instead, as we chase after knowing God more fully, we let him change us. Jesus in the gospel today um, was talking about salt and light and the city on a hill and these being like God's people are these things in this world. I think of salt being a flavor enhancer or light aiding sight or clarity um, or a city on a hill being a place of refuge because it's easy to defend. You know, if you think of war strategy, medieval war strategy, like the high ground is a benefit to you. Um, it's easier to defend when you're up higher. Um, all these things, like, we are called to be those things in this world. But frequently, if you turn on the news, we're more known as people who complain about stuff. About why, why this country isn't doing what we want it to do, or why, um, why the, the culture is shifting and we're not happy with it, or things like that. When it's not about us. As we pursue Christ, our heart and our motivation will be rooted in God's plan. And all the stuff we think is a good idea will be sorted through that, will be filtered through the lens of Jesus. And what I love about Jesus is Jesus comes in this passage and doesn't say, I'm just going to get rid of the law. You're my children, you're the children of God, you can do whatever you want. But instead, the motivation changes about why we follow it. We're no longer um, trying to earn a good grade with God, and that's not why we're doing the law. But instead, we know from knowing God that living the Ten Commandments, which Jesus simplifies as love God and love others, leads to community flourishing. If I pursue loving God, if I pursue loving my neighbor, things will change. And my motivation shifts from a good grade with God, maybe some extra crown or jewels in my crown, um, or a ticket to heaven. And instead of it being that, our motivation becomes the world needs to see God's design. The the world needs to be healed by God's love. We are called to live differently, not because of a reward that we may receive, but because God has the best design in mind. Now, depending on your generation, we may have a different idea of what reverence looks like in the church. Um, I remember being younger and like kids were supposed to sit and be quiet. 
I am not making a statement about Little Man, okay? That's not what's happening right he's now. Not quiet. No, he's not still and he's not quiet. But this is a perfect illustration, so thank you. Um, because we, we have this attitude of, I will inherit the church someday, but right now it's the grown-up's church. The kids will get it someday, but it's the grown-up's church for now. So don't run in church, be quiet, sit still, and be respectful. When it, <laughs> you are being perfect right now. Perfect right now. When in reality, it's his church too, right now. He's not going to inherit it someday. It is currently actively his church. It is currently actively a space for him to be able to come and interact with God through all of you. And frequently we, we have kids hold back themselves. Liberty is a little bit of a different uh, scenario. But frequently we have kids hold back themselves for the sake of reverence. And in the end we're fasting for something and kids learn, oh, God doesn't like me as I am. I have to be something else to connect with God. Yeah, we're holding them back from the word of God. Sometimes they need wiggles and snacks and giggles or wines in order to interact with God. So as we undo and look for heart transformation, we're going to try something a little uncomfortable over the next couple weeks. <laughs> no, he doesn't have to shoot. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. I remember being shushed in church. I know. That's the point. Um, starting next week, we'll now have some worship tools available. I'm not going to charge you, so you don't have to be under a certain age to use them. <laughs> Uh, so we have some fun worship ribbons and egg shakers. These may become noise, okay? But the point isn't for me to be completely satisfied with the perfect rhythm that every kid is shaking their egg. But for them to be able to know that as is, they get to interact with God. As they are now. That whatever picture in our head that we have of church needs to be released for what God actually designed. And that may be liberating little kiddos. Do you want this? Do you want this? Or do you want this one? He's like, I don't feel like I'm supposed to have this. He was doing so well. Yeah! To liberate them to be able to interact with God too. <laughs> And maybe as adults, we want, we want to have some fun. Um, there's obviously enough ribbons um, for people to use them, even if you're not a child. Um, but the idea that as we transform and let go of our own images of what we're supposed to be as, quote, Christians, we may actually leave room for God's spirit to define it. Whether it be adjusting our expectations of reverence or how we fill a church calendar. That we don't have to fill a calendar just to fill it, but that it should be intentionally filled with things that fit to the glory of God. Not just because we want to look like the coolest church that does all the fancy things. I mean, yes, we could get strobe lights, and fog machines. But just doing that doesn't make it fit. Instead, we're going to be intentional and set our hearts towards God. Not making it about ourselves, but about Christ. And I think that today being a communion Sunday seems to be the perfect format for resetting our hearts. Because it reminds us that this is about Jesus. That we are the church, we identify as Christians, but it's about him, not about us. 
And so today we're going to take the, the bread and the juice, and um, we are going to honor our intentions and turn them towards Christ. Now I want to make a disclaimer to you, it is not the normal tasty yummy shortbread Jesus. <laughs> it is a different bread today. There's your, your ahead of time warning, it's also gluten free. <laughs> that just might be because I had extra crackers on hand. Maybe. Um, so just be prepared that it will not, Jesus will not taste the same this time. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to invite our deacons forward. We're going to bless the elements, and I invite you to prepare your hearts for communion. I'm going to invite Gary to uh, bless the elements for us. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to be Christ-like as we go through this ceremony reminding us of your Son who gave his life for us and shed his blood. In God's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You will be invited to come forward and receive the elements um, and once you receive them you can take a seat and we will all take them together everyone is welcome at the table because jesus opens the doors for all people come to the table and remember our intentions do this in remembrance of him. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing benediction.
as God's child and serve others. Amen. <coughs>